experience the epic series that the world is watching and raving about. Catch up or relive the first three seasons of Game of Thrones now on HBO On Demand and watch back-to-back -back episodes anytime on your schedule. This year, join the legion of followers and enjoy past seasons of Game of Thrones, plus the premiere of season four on April 6th on HBO. Don't miss out. Sign up for HBO and get free access to HBO On Demand. Good evening, Bahamas. You're tuned in to NB12 Weekend, broadcasting from Cable 12 Studios on Robinson Road, coming up tonight in news. How government believes a national intelligence agency will help in the fight against crime. A value-added tax study conducted by the business community to be presented to government soon. And lupus being observed during the month of May. We share one woman's victory over the ailment. We've got those stories and so much more coming up. Happy Mother's Day. I'm Paige McCartney, and NB12 starts right now. here on NB12 Weekend. Legislation for the National Intelligence Agency is expected to be tabled and passed in the House of Assembly before the end of this year, according to National Security Minister Dr. Burdett Nottage. But little is known of the agency, which was formed shortly after the Progressive Liberal Party won the 2012 general election. Amid concerns that the agency is infringing on the personal rights of Bahamians, the National Security Minister shed more light on the agency and its role in the fight against crime. Christina McNeil tells us more. Exactly what does the National Intelligence Agency do? It's a question many Bahamians have asked recently after Free National Movement Deputy Leader Loretta Butler Turner questioned whether the agency was spying on Bahamians. Those claims have since been dismissed by Nottage, but he notes that they should get a better understanding of what the agency does when legislation is tabled later this year. The legislation has been virtually, the draft has been virtually completed. It's being considered now by various uh, interests, and uh, when it is finished, it is going to be brought to Parliament. So that, that is not very far off either. So he, he was absolutely correct. Um, this uh, request that we should have some uh, legislation that underpins it is of the policy of the government. Nottage would not say how soon that legislation is expected to be brought to Parliament. State National Security Minister Keith Bell told reporters in 2012 that the NIA would be able to do some work without any new laws. Government officials have claimed that the agency is responsible for collecting and transmitting valuable intelligence to law enforcement agencies in the fight against crime, particularly organized crime. Nottage explained that the NIA will supplement current intelligence gathering activities and the special intelligence branch of the Royal Bahamas Police Force. They're gathering intelligence to help us in the fight against crime. Pure and simple. There's nothing uh, unusual about it. Intelligence organizations that, uh, exist in many countries. The one in the Bahamas, the National Intelligence Agency, it's there to supplement the gathering of information against criminals. Former Royal Bahamas Defense Force Commodore Clifford Butch Scavella heads the agency. The creation of the NIA was a campaign pledge of the Progressive Liberal Party. Reporting for NB12, I'm Christina McNeil. Well, the first of nine new vessels for the Royal Bahamas Defense Force is set to arrive in the Bahamas even earlier than anticipated. The first vessel, the HMBS author Dion Hanna, was expected to arrive on June 13th, which was already ahead of schedule, but the National Security Minister says the ship will be in the Bahamas before the end of May. Everything is ahead of schedule. The first boat, the Azadi Anhana, um, is in Bermuda today. It was it went through the Azores. It in Bermuda, leaving Bermuda today, and it's now likely that it'll be about the 20th. So that's in another week and a bit. The HMBS author Dion Hanna is the first of nine new vessels purchased for the Defense Force. The second vessel, which has not been named just yet, is expected to arrive shortly after. The second boat is uh, being registered now, which means it is totally assembled. It's being registered so they can take it on its trials. 
uh, that boat we expected to come sometime in June, July. And it looks like that one will be on schedule. We have to name that one, which we'll be doing shortly. And the government borrowed $232 million to purchase the vessel from Dutch shipbuilder Stamen Shipyard. And to carry out ancillary works, the government expects to have all vessels by August 2016. In other news tonight, Minister, Ministry of Finance consultant Jane Smith has asserted that the government will have to redouble its efforts to reduce spending and find new revenue streams in the new fiscal year, considering that it's delayed the implementation of value-added tax. Smith, who is a former Minister of State for Finance, said the 2014-2015 budget will be a balancing act for the Christie administration as it will likely have to cut spending in some areas in order to increase funding in critical departments like health and law enforcement. During the mid-year budget debate for the 2013-2014 fiscal year, Prime Minister Perry Christie said the government expected the deficit, that's the gap between spending and revenue, to come in on target at $447 million at the end of the fiscal year. On Thursday, Minister of State for Finance Michael Halkidis forecasted that the Ministry of National Security, the Ministry of Health and the Department of Social Services will likely request more funding for the fiscal year, new fiscal year. But he couldn't say if all government ministries will receive across-the-board increases. Well, the Coalition for Responsible Taxation is optimistic about the completion of its value-added tax study conducted by Oxford Economics. Coalition co-chair Robert Meyer says the report is expected to be presented to government within the next week. The plan is to examine VAT at various rates and the viability of, of alternative taxes. We, we should have initial data, just just numbers that that you know that literally the model. Um, so we're looking at various scenarios of running um, through the model VAT at 15%, VAT at 10%, VAT at 7%, and then looking at running payroll tax through it, and then looking at some morphs of that, um, whether it's uh, comp bringing compliance up because as you know compliance is is uh, very low. In other words, compliance of existing taxes ease of implementation, the compliance, all of these factors will um, feed into what we, what we recommend as um, the, the, the best possible alter alternative or tax oh, and, yes. and fiscal reform. Meyer said if the study finds that compliance of the existing taxes is less than 50 percent, government will have to examine if compliance for VAT would be any better. He says that's part of the wider conversation of fiscal reform, something he says needs to be addressed before new tax regimes are introduced. You know, you don't go into the hospital and doctors start joking you with drugs and they don't know what's wrong with you in the first place, right? You, you want to understand the baseline before you start treating the, the, the problem. And you don't want to start treating the symptoms, right? The guy's got a headache. Well, what does that mean? Does he have a brain tumor? Or does he just have a headache? Or does he have a migraine? You actually need to understand that before you start treating it. That's the same with this issue. Because if you do tax reform and not fiscal reform, you're only addressing the symptom, not the problem. And Myers has acknowledged that a delay in the implementation of VAT or any other new tax would not help the country. Minister of State for Finance Michael Halkidis has suggested that VAT implementation be delayed until early 2015 on the advice of New Zealand tax consultants. Well, now that government has delayed VAT implementation, serious consideration must be made to the alternative forms of taxation, according to CEO of the Bahamas Chamber of Commerce and Employers Confederation, Edison Sumner. He says government should at the very least explore implementing multiple tax forms at lower rates instead of VAT all alone. He outlined the benefits and risks of corporate tax. Pros and cons. Pros are you get to tax the businesses who are doing well, who uh, might be able to afford to pay a tax, right? And you talk about some of the larger companies being the wealthier companies. Those are the ones who can afford to spend, you know, whatever it is, 3 5% of their, um, whether it's their profits or their annual returns to pay to the government in the corporate tax. The adverse side to that would be the uh, companies who are doing international business or the international companies doing business in the Bahamas Whereas they might decide, well, you know, if you're going to tax me for being here as a corporate citizen, why am I here? Maybe I can find another jurisdiction. Well, many of those vocal on the issue of that have suggested an income or salary tax instead. Sumner said while that may seem like the most viable option, there are some downsides to an automatic payroll tax scheme. And an income tax um, usually refers to anyone who has an income from any source. 
in this country, most of the persons in this country are employed, right? Meaning that they've only got a single source of income. So their payroll tax essentially will be their income tax because they've got no other income apart from that, that salary that they earn. So I think that's why the government saw the value-added tax as their best option. But we're saying that let's consider them all, put everything on the table, and that's what the consultants, the Oxford consultants are doing um, through their terms of reference from the coalition, is considering all the options. And when we've seen all the options, now let's make a decision based on the merits of each one uh, and deciding which one now is going to work best in the local economy. And private sector groups have also discussed a possible sales tax, but Sumner said that's one of the least likely forms to be considered. One of the main differences between the value-added tax and, say, a sales tax is that a sales tax is ordinarily applied at source or at the point of purchase. Value-added tax is applied at the point of entry, right? So as soon as you bring that, those goods into the country, you're paying the VAT at the border. Before you um, take that to your store and shelve it, VAT's already been applied to that. So the government would have gotten the money up front, so to speak. Whereas in sales tax, they're getting the money only after the product has been sold. So that is why I think that they've seen this as, as being their option, the best option, because with the value added tax, everybody who is a consumer of goods or services, and this is now applying to goods and services, whereas the sales tax would have applied largely just to goods, um, and that's why they looked at it that way. Also tonight, the Bahamas has joined the growing list of countries which have condemned the abduction of more than 200 Nigerian schoolgirls last month. In a brief statement released today, Minister of Foreign Affairs Fred Mitchell said the Bahamas government joins with the international community in demanding the return of the abducted schoolgirls back to their families. He said government will send a note of support to the Nigerian government and that all Bahamas foreign missions have been asked to communicate support. Stay with us when MB12 Weekend returns, an economic plan for the island of Andros with a focus on agriculture, plus later how you can get the specialized help you need for ill or recovering loved ones. We'll tell you more about those stories and so much more when MB12 Weekend comes right back.